Hey data junkies, welcome back to INST314, Statistics for Information Science, with your host, Sean Jansen. I'm glad to see you've made it with me through these long sets of videos here. We are at the end of the module for Inference Part 3. We are on topic 7.8, choosing your level alpha, and we'll try to make this a short and sweet video for you. So we're wrapping this up, and in this case, we're going to talk about the alpha and p value and where we might want to be at. So let's go ahead and get started. Now, so far, I've been throwing all sorts of things at you in this course. We've been talking about alphas and p-values and speed limits and speeds you're driving and type 1 errors, type 2 errors, false positives, false negatives, if it's important, if it's not important. Let's put that on a blender, blend it up, see what comes out. Because what happens when we're talking about if something is interesting or not? All right, I have a graphic up here on the screen where we have a particular p-value. And this is a nice little joke strip out from uh, 8XKCD. Again, I can't recommend their strip enough. And what they're trying to say is, get a, get, at a given level of p-value, where might you be at? And this is joking on the standard that most statistics tend to use, at least in the social science domain, a, a p-value of 0 0.5. And how sensitive are we to this case? So in this case, 0.1 is usually the farthest we're willing to go. And that's usually only when we have sample sizes under 100, which we'll get to. And they say, hey, this group could be possibly interesting. At 0 0.50, oh crap, redo your calculations, because that's our usual cutoff for most of these. Uh, somewhere between 0.1 and 0 0.05, eh, who knows. And then as you get really down to small p-values, you, you're good to go. And it's just sort of ribbing fun at uh, people like us that have to deal with this on a regular basis. So what we're going to go ahead and keep in mind, I've mentioned this before in class, is this concept of type 1 and type 2 errors and where your alpha comes into play. Now, we start with a saying that the null distribution is true, that there's no difference, and we're going to use alpha as a maximum level of risk to see, are we going to get a value so extreme that we can go ahead and reject this null hypothesis? Now, the type 1 and type 2 errors come into play here because the larger your level of alpha, the more risk you're willing to take, and so the less chance you're going to commit a type 1 error because you're willing to be more risk, or I'm sorry, the, let me rephrase. The larger your level of alpha, the greater the chance you're gonna commit a type one error because you might, reject, you might reject the null hypothesis when you weren't supposed to. Now, if you increase your alpha and you're increasing your type one error, you are decreasing your chance of the type two error. These type one and type two are head to head. The more you push and pull alpha one way or the other, the type 1 and type 2 errors move back and forth. If you shrink your alpha, make it smaller, that means there's a less chance of committing a type 1 error. You're going to increase the chance of committing a type 2 error. So let's take the significance into a little bit of a, a trap here then. CLT, Central Limit Theorem, says the bigger the sample, the more certain you get in your results. The more data you have, the more evidence you're going to get to try and disprove the null. And if you say the null is false, then your p-value is going to shrink as your sample size increases. So the smaller your p-value, the more likely you're going to be declared statistically significant, but that type 1 versus type 2 error is still a, an issue. Keep in mind that small differences can be magnified and marked as significant when your population gets higher and higher, and that's what I mean by that significance trap. As your sample size go up, you get all these great benefits, but you're going to start finding that smaller differences become magnified to say this is different, when sample sizes get larger, even if they're not necessarily meaningful or very far from your difference. So let's go ahead. Before we had an example talking about the number of hours you might watch, or families rather, households were watching of TV. And so we would then say they had uh, an x of 6, x bar 4, standard deviation of 3. And if we had these particular values here, then let's go ahead and say, what would the z-score be and the p-value of that z-score at different sample sizes? So if we had a sample size of 10 and we had those values up above, we could collect a z-score of approximately 2.1 with a p-value of 0 0.018. Pretty small p-value and pretty good number to reject a null hypothesis if we wanted to use a z-test. Now, if we have a sample size of 100, our z-score increases to 6.67 rounded and a p-value, a very small p-value, it's 1.3e negative 11. So we've got 10 zeros in front of a decimal point. So just by a tenfold increase in n, our z-score shot up. Same exact test statistics, but what it's then saying is we have so much more evidence against the null because our sample size is so much larger. If we did another tenfold increase and we had a 
n of 1000 with the same exact scores, we get a z-score of 21.1 rounded and a p-value of 5.83 e negative 99. So we can see here how sample size is going to play greatly into the test statistics that we're getting, even though the test statistics themselves, other than sample size, haven't changed. What if we wanted to go ahead and look at this in terms of a smaller difference? So here I've tweaked it, and before we had an x-bar of 4 with a standard deviation of 3. Now I'm taking an x-bar of 5.5 and a standard deviation of 3, still having an x-value of 6 that we're going to compare this to. And what we then see is a pop that the sample size of 10 gives us a z-score of 0.5, which is approximately a p-value of 0.3. Before, that z-score was a rounded 0.02, which is a lot smaller than 0.3. If we were doing some sort of hypothesis test to reject a null or not, this new one would say that it's not different, that 5.5 is not different from 6, where before 4 was different enough from 6. And that's a pretty big difference if you're talking about, you know, number of hours you're watching per day and half an hour versus an hour and a half. It could be meaningful. But if our sample size is 100, then the z-score here at 5.5 is up to 1.67, a p-value of 0 0.048. That's small enough to get under a p-value of 0 0.5. So now it's statistically significant when before it was not. And if we have an n of 1,000, our p-value becomes even smaller, and it's magnifying. So here we are saying that with the same difference, we're only having a half-hour difference, and at larger ends, we are now statistically significant, but the difference is small. It's, meaningful. it's not as meaningful having a half-hour difference as it was before with a two-hour difference, even though they could both be marked statistically significant. So keep in mind, alpha is our great compensator to help us with this. Alpha, we said, is the maximum level of risk you're willing to take. It's that bridge between the type 1 and type 2 error. They're in a constant tug of war, and alpha's stuck in the middle. And so what we want to know is, what role does alpha have if we're trying to prove that null is false? All right? And so keep in mind that we could have different sorts of ends, and we can have different levels of alphas. So what we could then use is this idea to think about this. Go ahead and say, what role does alpha have, assuming the null is false? Okay, so keeping in mind alpha in the role of the significance trap. When n is small, a higher level of alpha gives you better balance between type 1 and type 2 error. And it helps give you a marginal return as n becomes large. So the larger the n, the less bang for buck you're getting when alpha stays the same size. So we can shrink alpha to compensate as n becomes larger. Alpha is very important also because we use it when we build things like our confidence intervals. So the social science rule of thumb that I'm going to generally advise you to use in this course is that if n is less than 100, use an alpha of 0.1. If n is between 100 and 1,000, use an alpha of 0 0.05. And if n is larger than 1,000 but up to around 10,000, I'm sorry, if n is larger than around 10,000, go ahead and use an alpha of 0 0.01. So use those as each of your benchmarks. Up to that number, use the next preceding value. So 100 is 0 0.1, 1,000 is 0 0.05, 10,000 is 0 0.01. And you know you can move those around back and forth, but this will just help compensate for some of those statistical differences. And with that, we're going to wrap up inference part three, and I'll see you all in the next module.